Good morning. What's up, everyone? Hello, Light City. And a very special shout out to all of the mothers that are watching and all of the mothers that are a part of this ministry. And big shout out to the mother of Jesus who actually gave birth to Jesus, who is actually the reason that we're here. So Mary, shout out to you. And um, if you're a mother, you know, we, we love you. And uh, I hope you have a very special day today. And very excited to be here. It's Sunday. It's sunny outside. It's Mother's Day. What else can you ask for? Um, before we get started, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to get together and just hear your word. Lord, we know that you went through a lot to be able to get the gospel of who you are and just the truth about your nature back to us and that we be joined back to you. So God, we just bless you and I pray that you would use me however you choose to today and say whatever you would choose to say through me. And Father, that every mother that's watching would just get a very special touch from heaven, that they would feel your love and just encounter your presence in a brand new way today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this month we're talking about things that Jesus didn't say. And uh, I think that's very important because if you're not careful, we can kind of pick up on things that we think Jesus said or we think the Bible says, um, you know, and, and, and we can kind of be wrong about that. I know that I've been wrong. Um, and some of those things. And I love what Pastor Alex talked about last week of, you know, go into the world and do whatever makes you happy. Now, I don't know if y'all know Jesus like that, but Jesus sure didn't say anything like that. Now, he doesn't say that you have to sacrifice happiness in life for holiness, but there is a, a life of discipline and a life of, uh, I guess, like purity and sanctification that's required, you know, to follow him. Um, but Pastor Alex did a great job of showing like you can still enjoy life. You know, in God is really where life is. And so we're going to continue this month's series today, and uh, we're actually going to talk about something that I actually really like to talk about. And uh, it's one of those things that might make some people uneasy, and I apologize, just bear with me. It's going to be great. Today we're going to be talking about M-O-N-E-Y. That's right. We're going to be talking about moolah. We're going to be talking about bankroll, dinero, cash, dough. Dollar dollar bill, y'all. We're going to be talking about money. And most importantly, we're actually going to take a look at what Jesus had to say about money. Because believe it or not, Jesus talked a whole, a whole, a whole lot about money. And of course, with the title of this month series, Things That Jesus Didn't Say, we're also going to highlight a couple things that most people may think that Jesus said that he actually didn't say. So before we go any further, like I said, I know this concept of money can make some people real uneasy, especially in the church. So I brought a joke. Um, I figured, like, what better way to just kind of, you know, get let down the walls than to hopefully laugh. So I, I apologize if this joke isn't actually that funny. To me, it was mildly entertaining. And um, so I can promise you that, mildly entertaining. So in the midst of travel one day, Jesus asked his disciples, and he said, who do people say that I am? And his disciples answered him. And they said, some say that you're John the Baptist, returned from the dead, and others say that you're Elijah or one of the prophets. And Jesus answered, but who do you say that I am? Peter thought, and then he answered, and he said, Lord, thou art the Logos, existing in the Father as his rationality, and then by an act of his will being generated in consideration of the various functions by which God is related to his creation, but only on the fact that the scripture speaks of a father, a son, and of a Holy Spirit, each member in the Trinity being co-equal with every other member, and each acting inseparably and with interpreting every other member. With only an economic subordination to God, but causing no division which would make the substance no longer simple. And then Jesus responded unto Peter and said, What? So I don't know if that was funny to you, but I promised you mildly entertaining, and hopefully it just broke down some walls before we, we just jump right into it. You see, Jesus showed us that God's desire and intention for us is to prosper. And he enabled us to do so. He also equipped us to do so. And in the Bible, we see countless times where Jesus actually encourages us to do so. You see, money and prosperity, I know it's a, it's a funny topic. I'm not going to lie, um, especially in the church. And, you know, there, there's, uh, I'm sure there's some reasons for that. But it's also a very misunderstood topic. You see... The funny thing is that money is something that everyone needs. 
but don't nobody want to talk about it, especially in the church. It's like you can talk about salvation. You could talk about, you know, baptism. You could talk about prayer, but don't talk about money. You know, get a little uncomfortable with that. And um, what I really like is that Jesus wasn't afraid to encounter these situations and talk about money. You see, maybe it's religion or maybe it's from, you know, seeing greeting pe greedy people or Maybe it's just the own woundings in our past that have kind of brainwashed us to think that money and wealth or even prosperity is a bad thing or not a godly thing. Because after all, cleanliness is next to godliness, right? And God helps those who help themselves. And most importantly, because we're talking about money, blessed are the poor because money is evil. After all, Jesus did say those things. Or did he? Trick question. Again, Jesus showed us that God's desire, you know, he only, Jesus said that he only came to do what the father told him to do and what he showed him to do. He only said what the father told him to say. And Jesus showed us that our heavenly father, God, almighty Abba, desire and intention is for us to prosper. And he has enabled us, equipped us, and he encourages us to do so. You see, it's funny because these things can be very easily taken out of context. You know, lots of things about money and lots of things that Jesus said, if we're not careful, can just be so misconstrued by religion. Because Jesus didn't say blessed are the poor because poverty is good or that living an extremely humble life with just enough to get by is the will of God. He didn't say that. In fact, for him to say that would contradict everything that the blessing that Jesus came back to earth to restore to us, it contradict everything that he did. You see, this would certainly contradict scriptures and phrases that Jesus said in the Gospels, like John 10.10. 10. I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Or in another translation, it says, I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. And for money to be evil, it also contradict Luke 6.38, which says, Give, and it shall be given unto you a good measure, Press down, increase, multiplied, will it be given back to you? Now, just a little bit of a JT paraphrase there. But if you think about what Jesus said, how can you give if you don't have anything? And if increase in wealth and abundance was bad, then why did Jesus say that when we give, it'll be given back to us, not just equally, but multiplied in abundance? You see, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul tells us, that one of the main reasons that Jesus actually came here to this earth, one of the main reasons that Jesus came here for us was not just so that we could go to heaven when we die, although very important. Super glad Jesus came to do that. That is utterly utmost important. Can, can I get an amen? But Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 that Jesus, though he was rich, he actually chose to become poor for our sakes. Why? So that through poverty, we might be poor? So that through his poverty, we might just have enough? So that through his poverty, we might have less than enough? No. You see, the Bible says that for our sakes, Jesus became poor so that we might become rich. Now, to help you out, I did the homework. I looked up in the English dictionary, in the Greek lexicon, in the Hebrew Bible, I was even going to look in a Spanish dictionary, but I didn't have time. But I really looked at what this word rich means, because after all, if G one of the reasons that Jesus came here to this earth was so that we might become rich. What does that rich mean? Well, see, the English dictionary defines rich as wealthy and abundant. The Greek lexicon, which is one of the more accurate of, of course, the Bible um, translations means rich and wealthy. These are real definitions of rich. And then in Hebrew, the word ashar, which is actually translated rich, means, actually, guess what it means? It means rich and wealthy. So yes, blessed are the poor, but why? Why are the poor blessed? You see, what Jesus was actually doing on that mountain was he was prophesying and he was changing things. And I believe he was saying that blessed are the poor because I am here. You see, what Jesus did was he restored to us his blessing. Remember the blessing, which is what he came back to restore. And in that blessing, according to Proverbs 10, 22, and if you go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 28, I encourage you to do so. 
Um, the good thing is Jesus took away the curse and we live in the fullness of the blessing. So, you know, when I was a kid, I used to be really afraid to read Deuteronomy 28 because I'd read the blessing and I'd be like, ooh, I really want that. And I look at the curse and I'm like, ooh, I don't want that. And then I get afraid because I'm like, oh, if I do one of those, then I won't get any of this. And it was just chaotic. You can't live that way. But hallelujah, praise Jesus. Jesus came and he became the curse for us and he took care of the curse so that we might be restored to the blessing. So that's what we're going to focus on. And the Bible says in Proverbs 10, 22, that the blessing of the Lord makes us ashar. There's that word again. The blessing of the Lord makes us rich. And he adds no sorrow, toil, or ill gain to it. So my question, is money evil? Are people who desire to make money evil? No, some of them maybe. But money is not an evil thing. You see, Jesus didn't say that money is the root of all evil. He didn't. Jesus said that the love of money is the root of all evil. You see, Jesus is after our heart, and he's after our trust. And if he can trust us, and if he has our heart, he has no problem with us having money, because, again, he desires that we would prosper. You see, I used to always wonder, because in the Bible it says, you know, you can't serve God and mammon, you know, God or money. And I'm like, well, how do I know if I'm serving money? Because I got to go to work. I got to, you know, whatever, whatever. I think about money. I want to make money. Uh, you know, I, I know it takes money. I want to be able to give money. And I'm like, well, how do I know if I'm serving God or money? And then I realize it's a pretty simple answer. And hopefully we all can think about this. Because money isn't evil. But the love of money is. And I realize that. A very good indicator, kind of a litmus test or litmus test to find out if you're in love with money over God. Simple question. Are you willing to put Jesus on the back burner for it? And are you willing to do the wrong thing to get it? You see, I know a little something about doing the wrong thing to get money. So <laughs> I'm going to be honest here. All right. So many of you don't know this part of me, but when I was growing up, um, I know, let me just say, I know what it's like to be poor, all right? So this isn't some, you know, one of those prosperity messages where we're like, being poor isn't real and, you know, the struggles aren't real. Struggles are real, okay? It's just, I didn't know the truth. It's the truth that sets you free. When you realize what Jesus came here to pay for, your whole life changes and a whole world opens up to you. But I know a little something about being poor. When I was, when I was a child, I remember being homeless at different stages in life. And, you know, my mom did the best that she could. Amazing mother. Hey, mom, if you're watching, I love you. Happy Mother's Day. Um, but I remember just, you know, my father wasn't around and we, we went through some rough stretches. And I remember different times in my life being homeless and living in shelters and living in out of hotels and not really having enough, all right, to, to say the least. So I know what it's like to be poor. And I also know what it's like to be driven by mammon and money because at a very young age, you know, when going through that, I made the resolve that, you know what, I'm going to get money. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to be poor when I grow up. I'm going to do whatever I got to do. And, you know, that led me into doing some very silly things and also some very dangerous things. Um, <laughs> man, I've done a lot. I've stolen vehicles for cash. I, you know, sold drugs for cash and even did some more silly things. Like, for instance, I remember growing up sixth grade, I remember I, I tried out for the school band and um, I kept getting in trouble, so I got kicked out of band. All right, got kicked out of band. Uh, I just wanted to be a little drummer, you know. I saw the movie Drumline. I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. And then uh, I got kicked out of band and I was like, you know what? Forget that. So I got on my computer and somehow my uncle, or actually my cousin and I, had this random idea because we still had all of our band paraphernalia. Uh, we put on all of our band paraphernalia and we put together a fake fundraiser letter and said, something, something, McClintock School Band, you know, would you like to give a donation to help out the school band? And in return, we'll send you Darien Lake tickets. Well, it's actually called um, Carowinds in Charlotte, but you know, you get it. Darien Lake tickets. We'll send you Krispy Kreme donut coupons. We'll send you movie tickets. We promised the world. And we went door to door, knocking and showing and putting on our little sixth grader face. Hello, would you like to help us? And uh, we collected a boatload of money. But see, I was driven by money. I wasn't serving Jesus. I was willing to do the wrong thing to get it. I got plenty more stories, but I, I, can't, I can't even go into it. But 
What I can say is from a very young age, I always had a desire to make money. And then I'll be honest, when I grew up and I started getting back into church, I kind of felt guilty about that. You know, like, is money wrong? Is it wrong for me to want to have it? Is it wrong for me to want to make it? Because I can't pretend like I don't. You know, I go to work every day and, you know, I want to be a big baller shot caller, not just so I can blow it all on myself. No. Although I do want to enjoy things, I want to be a blessing. I want to change the world. It doesn't take looking too long to realize that in order to change the world, you got to have some cash. You know, that Crystal Ridge Dream Center took some cash. Building training centers takes cash. Orphanages, group homes, you want to start a business, you want to employ people, you want to, you want to go on a missions trip, do you want to send others on missions trips? That takes cash. All of these things. It takes money. We can reach people without it, but we can reach even more with it. And I'm a firm believer that, you know, the Bible says, Jesus ain't coming back until the gospel is preached to all the ends of the earth. How does that happen? Does that mean people physically walk to the ends of the earth and find every single person? Maybe. But you know how I think it's going to happen? Technology. And you know what technology takes? Money and lots of it. You see, can I tell you a secret? It's not that big of a secret if you're, you know, been listening. Jesus knows that too. You see, money, again, is one of the most talked about things in the Gospels. And contrary to popular belief and things that maybe we've been taught just by wrong thinking, Jesus is pro-wealth. You see, he's a good father and he represents our Heavenly Father who only wants good things for his kids. And I'll say it again. Jesus showed us in the Gospels, and I encourage you to look, like really seek it out, that God's desire and intention for us is to prosper. And he also enabled us and equipped us, and he also encourages us to do so. So before we go on, I have another joke. Again, I don't know how funny this is going to be. Um, it made me chuckle, so I could promise mildly entertaining. But I figured this would be a good transition point. You know, if I've said anything that might have made you upset or rubbed you the wrong way or ruffled some feathers, maybe I can just help kind of pat the feathers down a little bit with a joke, okay? So <laughs> there was a rich man who was quite distressed over the prospect and the fact of not being able to take his riches with him when he died. So before he died, he loaded up his briefcase with two gold bars from his private vault, hopped on his private jet, went to his family, and he gave them instructions to have the case locked with a key, handcuffed to his wrist, and have the key placed into his grave clothes. You see, his family carried out his orders exactly to the T. When he finally died and, or passed away and arrived at the pearly gates, he had his briefcase with him, with him, key in hand, and he was super excited. He ran up to St. Peter, and St. Peter asked, what do you have in your suitcase? Very proudly, the man unlocked the case. He opened it up and he displayed his two gold bars. And St. Peter said, oh, nice, okay, you brought pavement. You see, if you don't understand that joke, in Revelations, the Bible tells us, there's a pair, uh, passage of scripture that says, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Okay, John is having a vision. Um, and in this vision, he's actually seeing into heaven. And so he's actually getting a glimpse and seeing things of what heaven actually looks like. And here's what the Bible has to say. Here's what John has to say. He says, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls and every several gates was of one pearl and the street of the city was of pure gold. Hear that again. The streets of the city were of pure gold. Now this ain't make-believe. This is in the Bible. If you believe the Bible, you have to believe this. The streets of heaven are pure gold. You see, this is who your father is. This is who God is. He's wealthy. He has an abundant mindset, a rich mindset, an extravagant mindset. If I had a whole bunch of gold to blow, I'm probably not going to pave the streets. You know what I mean? I'm not going to pave the city of Buffalo streets with gold, but this is, how, this is who he is. He knows no lack. And you see, God said in John chapter 3, through John, he said, Beloved, I wish above all things, this is to anyone who's reading the Bible, this is to anyone who's reading the Bible, he says that, Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health. Yes, 
and grow spiritually. Yes. So even as your soul prospers, but he says, I wish above all things that you would prosper. You see, God gave us the ability to create wealth. Money is not evil. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Because again, like as this, as this says, God's desire is that we would prosper and have more than enough even as he prospers. Now I'm not recommending you go melt your gold chains and like pave your driveway with it, okay? But that's, that's an image of who our Heavenly Father is. And when we see him, we start to see ourselves. Now, I'll say this. Some people are like, oh yeah, prosper in heaven or streets of gold in heaven. Yes, that's true. But we also pray here. Jesus instructed us to play, pray that right here on earth that we experience life as it is in heaven. So where? Right here on earth. When? Right here, right now. And why? Why does God want us to prosper so much? I think that's the big question. And I think there's many answers. <laughs> I don't know that I have the liberty or the time to go through all of the answers, but I will say, I'll say two. I'll say three. Number one, because God loves us. You know, I didn't have the pleasure of growing up with a father, so I can't really speak to, you know, my experience with the Father literally comes from Father God. You know, I had a grandfather who was amazing, who just passed, and, you know, pastors and mentors and coaches, but, like, my relationship and my understanding of a father has literally come from Father God, and he's who we want to be like. And, like, think about it. Like, a good father would want their kids to have the best. He would want his children to have no lack, to have no need. Why? because he loves us. So I think that's reason one why God wants us to prosper and why it's so important to us, because he loves us and he wants us to be able to enjoy things. Again, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. And then he didn't stop there. He said, in life, in abundance, not just life, not just barely get by, not just scratch and scrape and pay your bills and praise God, he meets all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Yes, needs need to be met, but God promised abundant and overflow. And that leads into point number two of why I think it's so important to God that we prosper. And I think it answers it actually in the Bible. It says that in 2 Corinthians, so that we would have more than enough to be able to give into every good work. You see, when you have more than enough, you're able to be a blessing. When we have more than enough, we're able to do some things. We're able to fund some things. We're able to answer other people's prayers. You know, how would it feel for us to start to become answers to people's prayers? You know, there's a family out there who's believing for a new vehicle. How would it feel if not only did we just pray that, you know, pray with them that God would meet that need, but that we're so blessed and we're so abundant, we're able to help them with that. That single mother with those kids, that we're able to help her with that new vehicle. Or that family whose home is about to foreclose, that we're able to help them and just pay that off. You see, like we, God desires that we could be here and we can and he's enabled us and equipped us to do so. And reason number three, I believe it's really important to God that we prosper is, in Isaiah, God says that I will use you as a symbol of my covenant. And what I think that means is as an example of his goodness. You see, Jesus in Matthew chapter six told us, don't worry, don't worry about money, don't worry about tomorrow, don't worry about food, don't worry about clothing, don't worry about your house, don't worry about all these things because you have a heavenly father. But he also said that these things do the Gentiles seek. The people who don't know God, these are the things that they're after. They're after money. Many of them have sold their soul after money for provision, all of these things. And God wants to use this as a symbol of his covenant to show the goodness of God. Like, hey, you don't have to do that. God will give you life and life more abundantly. And we can be examples of that. You see, that's what it's about. It's not about greed. It's about experiencing the love of God. It's about living in that life and life more abundantly. It's about giving those good, giving to those good works. And good works takes money sometimes, especially here on earth. So as we close, I would, I would like to pray. And before I do, you know, I shared the story about how growing up, I always had a desire to make money and it was definitely twisted at a young age because I, I saw, you know, I didn't see money and I got problem of, I got tired of not having money. And so I, I vowed to get it. I vowed to never be poor. I, I vowed to, 
you know, make sure my kids always had lunch money, all of these things. And, and that drove me in the wrong direction. But the desire inside of me to actually have wealth and to make money was not wrong. And so I'd just like to say that if there's anyone out there listening to this, anyone in the church or anyone who's kind of felt rejected by the church because you're in business or because you have a desire to make money, I just want to say shame off you and I apologize. Money is not an evil thing. Money is not a bad thing. Jesus is pro-wealth. You know, a minister is not more spiritual than a business person if they're being led by God and vice versa. So I like to pray for everyone here and hopefully this didn't come off too harsh. Hopefully this didn't come off judgmental or, or like I don't care about people, you know, with, with less than. I do. I experienced that. I lived that. Okay. I, I, I lived that and I saw it. I saw what that does to people around me. I saw what that does to communities in my own family and, and overseas. I've seen it firsthand. And I know, I know what money in the hands of a believer in the hands of the right person can do. You see, I'm tired of strip clubs popping up. I'm tired of, you know, houses being vacated. I'm, I'm tired of these things. I don't want that anymore. You see, as we believe God for money and more influence and more increase, I believe we'll have to be the ability and the means to actually change some things, to actually say what goes in our city, to actually say what goes in our town, to be able to not just pray for the poor when we walk down the street, very important. Okay, but also to help them. And I don't mean just hand them a five or a $10 bill, although yes, very important, especially if God leads you to do that. But I mean, build a training facility to be able to teach them economic principles and basic computer skills so that we can teach them what we know and, and preach the gospel and send them off. These things cost money. And I believe that God's desire is that we would all increase and that we'd have more than enough to be a blessing and to give to every good work in Jesus' name. So, Heavenly Father, we, we just, we bless you and just thank you for this word. Thank you that you care about us so much that you didn't just send us to this earth just to kind of get by or just to scratch and scrape or just to struggle. But God, you, Jesus, you personally came so that we would have life and life more abundantly. And so, Father, we just open our, our minds, we open our hearts and, and maybe we don't completely understand all of this, and maybe we still have some questions, but God, we agree and we choose to just embark on this journey to A, know you as provider, and to B, experience the life and the life that you have more abundantly, especially for us in the area of finances and wealth. And Heavenly Father, I bless everybody who's listening, who's watching. I bless you in Jesus' name and every mother who's watching. I pray that today is just a super amazing day for you. I pray that you just feel the love of God and that today's just a very awesome day. Thank you guys so much for joining. God bless you all. We'll see you next week.